Katia, right here, as you look between the buildings across the river, and the treetops on Stafford Heights, you can see a big brick mansion. The trees up there called Chatham Manor. Chatham was built in 1768. That was the home of a friend of George Washington's named William. And that might be the only home in this country to have been visited by both Presidents George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Leaves that fall off the trees in the winter makes it much easier to see chowder from this side of the river at this time of the year without the foliage. And of course, you'll always get a great view of it. You get in the car, take a short drive over the bridge, or a nice day like this, just walk over there and visit Chatham, as maintained by your National Park Service. And bring that camera with you when you go over there, because when you stand in front of Chatham today, look across the river, the Fredericksburg skyline, you're going to see the same courthouse spire, the same church steeple, it's almost the same skyline today that Ingets oversaw when they stood there looking at Fredericksburg before the Civil War battle here in 1862. It was late November of 1862, one of the biggest and certainly the best equipped army the world had ever seen began to arise to cross the river on that ridge, Stafford Heights. The United States Army of the Potomac was huge. 118,000 men. Give us an idea, put that in some perspective. 118,000 is about the population of all Stafford County over there today. Stafford has five high schools, three Walmarts. <laughs> the command of this huge force across the river is Major General Ambrose Burnside. Burnside's plan is to cross the river. He wants to occupy Fredericksburg, use this as a supply base to attack the Confederate capital 60 miles to the south at Richmond. Richmond is on this side of the river. Union's bus from Washington, 60 miles to the north. That's on the other side. And Burnside feels this is the best place to cross, which it is, even though the river's a lot deeper than 1862. Burnside knows Confederates <coughs> have burned the bridges that made it to the city, but the general has a plan for them, sort of these portable floating pontoon bridges to make the army from Washington. And for some reason, this equipment arrives 10 days late. Two, week, two weeks go by, Union troops have to wait around over there in the cold and the rain as they watch the river rise. They also watch 78,000 Confederates under the command of Robert E. Lee to get up on the high ground that's west of the city on a ridge called Marie's Heights. I'll take you up there a little bit later. 1,500 Mississippian sharpshooters are positioned in the warehouses down on this river bank about 2 o'clock in the morning, December 11th. These guys start to hear some activity on the other side. They can't see through the heavy fog at first that night, but they can hear wagons rolling down the hill. There's shouting and splashing going on just across the river. They know that the Union engineers are floating out to the first sections of that bridge, <coughs> and the crossing is underway. The bridge is supposed to be finished by sunrise, but they're only about halfway out when the sun comes up. As the fog starts to lift, the unarmed men working on the end of the bridge just become sitting ducks in the middle of the river at the end of their heavy sniper fire from the Mississippis in these warehouses. That's the Burnside shells the town. 150 guns open up on the riverbank here. Within about two hours, they destroy every warehouse but that stone warehouse we just passed. At two in the afternoon, a lot of buildings in this north end of the city are on fire, but no matter how many shells they throw at the Confederates, they can't clear out the snipers. And Whenever they come back out there and try to work on the bridge, they come under fire and down some buildings along Sophia Street. Union officers realize they're not going to get their bridge built this way, so they call for volunteers to jump into the pontoon boats and just paddle across. About 35 men and two boats manage to land on the bottom of the steep river back up here on the right. They scramble up the hill, hold off the snipers until reinforcements can paddle over, and it follows is one of the only instances of house to house street fighting that occurred during the entire Civil War. Street fighting is courageous up and down side streets like the one that's run on to here until after dark. And finally, around nightfall, the Mississippians get the order to withdraw. So they join the main body of the Confederate Army behind the city on Maurice Heights. That leaves downtown here in Union now. So for the next two days, Union engineers build five more bridges downstream. I mean, the rest of those troops and supplies just come across unopposed over the next two days. If they, they still have to deal with the 78,000 Confederates just a mile away on Marie's Heights. And you'd think that that's 200,000 enemy soldiers standing here looking at one another across just a couple hundred feet of river for three weeks. You might think they'd have been trying to shoot each other that whole time. 
before the crossing got underway is a kind of informal truce between the privates on both sides here. Most of them would just line up on the riverbanks every day and stand there and shout insults across at each other. And they'd even trade back and forth across the river. Confederates are almost always happy to trade their southern tobacco for the Union soldiers' imported coffee beans. They make those little toy sailboats and put packages of mostly coffee and tobacco, but um, all kinds of things went across the river in trade between those men before the killing started here in 1862. Irish, Irish immigrants fought on both sides in about equal numbers uh, throughout the Civil War here at Fredericksburg. Here stories about Irish troops swimming across that cold river and spent some time with their former countrymen those days that led up to the fighting here. side of this next block is what might be the oldest home in the city. There are parts of this uh, White House behind the fence on the left day back of the early 1740s. That's a private home, just changed hands um, late last year. See the new owners that are investing in a major renovation. And that's time of the American Revolution. This was the home of a patriot named Charles Dick. Charles Dick and his business partner a man named Fielding Lewis went into business manufacturing muskets for the Continental Army from 1775 until the revolution ended eight years later. These men used their own money to manufacture and repair muskets. They even paid to have them shipped to Virginia's volunteers in the field. Now, probably these guys, they were working for a government that didn't levy taxes very well. And they also didn't have much credit to borrow from foreign banks to pay for war and for defense industries. After eight years of revolution, the Congress had no money in the Treasury and never paid these guys back. Charles Dick lost his head to debt. His partner, Fielding Lewis, didn't live to have to see his family sell Kenmore Plantation, trying to pay back his war debt. So both of these men, these are the wealthiest men in the city in 1775. They both gave nearly everything that they had for this country. left corner there's the Fredericksburg Baptist Church. Look up as we go through the intersection. Um, that is one of those steeples that the Union soldiers could see from across the river 156 years ago. It's building predates the Civil War by almost 10 years, built in 1854. We think the architect of this church building was James Rennick. James Rennick was one of the most important American architects of the 19th century. I'll show you another one of Rennick's buildings uh, right up the street here in just a second. First time in this right corner is Hyperion Espresso. Anyone here say that's not only the best? Anyone here say that's not only the best cup of coffee in Fredericksburg? We think that's the best coffee in the world in there. They like to say they don't know where George Washington slept here, but he woke up and had period. <laughs> Big sandstone and brick building on the left was our city hall from 1816 until 1982. At that time, this was the oldest continuously used city hall building in this country. Today, it's the Fredericksburg Area Museum. Uh, they're open five days a week. Today is one of the days, so uh, you can take the opportunity to come see the museum here on a uh, Sunday. St. George's Church in this left corner is not quite the oldest church building but the congregation's been here almost as long as the city has been. The Church of England was built on this corner in 1734. They built three churches on this site since the days when uh, George Washington was a member of the congregation at St. George's. 
This building dates back to 1849. Beautiful low churches, uh, red doors are always unlocked. You're more than welcome to go in and look around if you want to. Three of the stained glass windows in St. George's come from Tiffany's in New York City. Buried in its little cemetery back there are some, some relatives of people, you know. The father of Martha Washington was Colonel John Danbridge. He's buried here. So that was the brother of the sea captain, John Paul Jones. On the left here, it's an unusual uh, stucco building on the left with the green copper roof. It is not a church. That's the old courthouse. It's built in 1852. The courthouse here was also designed by James Rennick, a member of the architect. He did the Baptist church two blocks behind us on Princess Anne Street. James Rennick is um, probably best known as the architect of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. It was like that red Smithsonian castle on the mall in Washington. So the uh, Rennick building you might have seen. He did like to work in brick and stone. James Rennick must have turned over in his grave in 1916 when they stuccoed the old courthouse. This is a sandstone or brick building that had a slate roof. It was designed and built in the 1850s. The courthouse is damaged in a fire around the turn of the century. That's probably why it was stuccoed. I'm going to go way out of the limb here and guess that's why they built the firehouse right next door in 1905. That's, that's an office building now. Uh, the old courthouse building is uh, not in use anymore. It just sits there empty since the new courthouse is built here on the left. So this is a new courthouse built there about uh, three and a half years ago in 2014. I'll ride down to the south end of the city now and show you a couple of Fredericksburg's early suburbs. By the mid 1700s, the city would have extended south, only about to where you see the red light and the railroad bridge. In 1752, there was an attorney named Roger Dixon who decided to change careers and go to real estate. He bought 350 acres in the south end of the city, served at these 40 riverfront lots, and spent the rest of his life savings building a beautiful model home that's still standing on Carolina Street today. I'll show you that house in a few minutes. Roger Dixon must have figured he'd get rich selling real estate to the other wealthy professionals and businessmen of the area, but none of them were buying in 1752. Roger Dixon couldn't sell any of those lots. Deeply in debt when he died, the model home sat there empty for 20 years before a man named Dr. Mortimer bought it. But Dr. Mortimer came along at a much better time in the real estate market. It was a little bit more successful selling lots, the new section after the revolution in the late 1700s. And I'm going to show you some of my favorite of the city's 18th century homes. You'll see them over block to the left on Caroline Street in just a second. The first ride down Princess Anne Street. Houses on this end of Princess Anne Street were built a little bit later. These are built in the 1800s. Wealthy people were pretty well established on the Carolyn Street by that time. These are the homes of middle class or working class people in the 19th century. You can tell by, by looking at the size, and especially at the width of these houses. This, um, this green one on your left is a good example. It's built in 1882. You notice how this, and all the houses in this part of the street, you can see how, um, how narrow they look by today's standards. And there's a good reason for that. Here in 19th century Fredericksburg, property taxes are only assessed on the width of the front yard. Up until 1920, those taxes were based on foot frontage, and that was it. So it didn't really matter how big the house was, even how much land you had going back. If you worked for your living, you would have to pay those high property taxes. One way around them in those days was to build or buy your house on a little 20 to 24 foot lot. 